Good day, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the 40 Orty Podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley. And you may be surprised to see that there is a new episode appearing on the feeds in the ether of the internet. Um, since I have not probably posted a podcast for like at least three or four months, there's been a lot going on in my life. And to kind of keep it short, I am pivoting towards making a lot more YouTube presentation style content and live streaming. Um, it just seems like a, a good decision for me at the moment. And the schedule from now on will be around about like once a month, I think. And it's going to be kind of a here and there kind of approach to podcasting. It's not going to be on a schedule, but there will be podcasts coming out with different interesting people that I found on the internet who who also want to do a bit of podcasting. So without further ado, this is season three. Hooray! Bow, bow, bow. Let's get the fireworks going. It's, it's, it's all happening here, guys. <laughs> oh, my God. Brilliant introduction from from me, I must say. I have my guest here today to talk about a very interesting topic about autism and cannabis, which is something that has for a long time had a lot of uh, stigma behind it, a lot of misinformation, a lot of uh, quite strange laws around it, I think at some point. But it's something that has been been increasingly looked into for its uh, medicinal properties. And today I, w I want to talk a little bit about the link between uh, cannabis and autism, not not due to the, the rates, but more um, what are the benefits, disadvantages, you know, possible experiences that people might have with cannabis, things related to THC, CBD, you know. THC in the UK, unless you have a medical license, is illegal, recreational. In the US, it's a little bit different. I think a few other countries as well. So enough rambling by me. I have my guest here today. I've forgotten how to pronounce your name. That is awful. <laughs> Mayabi? May May Miyabi. Miyabi. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go for it again. Uh, Sorry. No worries. Yeah, no, do it. That's, that's really bad. <laughs> it's actually not bad. I've heard a lot worse, so you're good, man. Okay. Okay, we'll, we'll go for it then. How are you doing today? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good. I'm excited to chat with you. I always, I really like listening to British accents. I don't, it's like such a calming and reassuring uh, sound and voice. I'm, yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk about it. This is something that is very central to my whole life and actually also my research career so have you ever been to the uk i have not i've i've had a layover once but i think it was in london but it was not enough time to get to get off the plane or do anything i played water polo um in italy for a bit and so we just stopped and, and had a layover, but I never, I didn't have time to actually leave. And I, I would really love to visit and, you know, meet up with there's, there are, there are great scientists doing advocacy work in the UK and there's research going on at universities and mm -hmm. all of it is happening. So despite the laws still remaining frustrating uh, in many countries, things are changing. There is a lot more information that we have, both in the scientific literature from universities and in the communities. And as you mentioned, the US, which, which is where I am, I'm in Massachusetts. You know, we have increased accessibility to medical cannabis and also to adult use recreational cannabis really significantly. And in, in doing that, we've, we've, we've found a lot of things, we've learned a lot of things. And I think one of the main things we're, we're learning and finding, which we've already known is that it's relatively safe, has a low toxicity, and has a really, really high potential therapeutic benefit. And I think it's great that we're going to talk about all aspects about that and how specifically for atypical people, there can be potential sensitivities or even potential like uh, hypo reactions, like under reactions. So yeah. I think it goes both ways. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is interesting whenever it's you know, there's been a lot of pa laws passed on on particular compounds, which 
you know, it's it's kind of crazy thinking about it with like sort of the rampant use of opioids and things of that nature where, you know, it's it's only kind of well, not necessarily like in very recently, but recently that um, scientists have been able to start looking into things uh, like the therapeutic benefits of like what well, it's like ecstasy and MTMA and uh, psilocybin. Yeah. Yeah, it's and it's huge. I mean, that's a whole another piece. I think I'd probably say uh, it, it's definitely not what I've done my formal academic and industrial research career on. But I have recently taken a course with Dr. Joe Tafur, who's a medical doctor. He's an MD, but he's also a trained Shipibo shaman, and cool. he gives a course on integrating psychedelics into modern medicine. And I took it last year. And it changed my perspective on a lot of things. And I've used psychedelics medicinally, and I do advocate and talk regularly for them. I actually helped my city to decriminalize psilocybin-containing mushrooms for the medicinal benefits. And as you said about the opioid issues that we have going on around the world and bringing it back to cannabis, we do know that for both of these things, psychedelics, but also with cannabis, we, we do know that cannabis can be used as a replacement or as something mm -hmm. that can reduce the amount of opioids that someone takes who's in chronic pain. Pain mm -hmm. is one of the top three uses for cannabis, regardless of whether you have a medical card or you're using adult use or recreationally. So, you know, we we know these things. Cannabis is a plant, grows out of the ground. We've evolved with it. And I, I for one, definitely in a state of disagreement with legislature that limits people's ability to use it as a medicine, um, especially when I think, you could grow it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess you can, you can grow all sorts of like things which are not necessarily. Right. That's what like I'm saying. Like, flower and exactly. Like, uh, or uh, the... geranium, geraniums are pretty poisonous if you were to concentrate them, right? Like there's plenty yeah. of there's plenty of things that are unregulated agricultural or floral botanical, right? That, you know, we don't regulate this way and, and those don't have therapeutic benefits. So it, it is wild to, to me at least, but I have yeah. a very difficult time understanding ulterior motive. Like I, I have a very linear, I, like I have a very linear understanding of the, the motives of, human health and like the profitability of a corporation doesn't really factor in for me at all for why, why we should be doing the things that we do or, you know, I guess it's just how can you help people live a higher quality of life? Like you see all the suffering that goes on and there's so much suffering in the world, just period. The, the world is suffering. And this is kind of, you know, I I'm Buddhist. I, I was raised like with a Buddhist, like, my grandmother has like a, an influence and the world is suffering. So I get that. And like, wouldn't you want to decrease that? Wouldn't you want to like increase people's like health and happiness and overall quality of life? And it just, so that part has never really made any sense to me. And I, I I've never that. really, never really yeah. understood it. You know, I feel, I feel that very deeply. I mean, I suppose a little bit of a background because, you know, I've talked about all sorts of, kind of um things on this podcast but not necessarily like things that might be considered to be taboo i guess like to, to speak about which is it, it is very silly to me because a little bit kind of my background i was i did do biomedical sciences at, at the university of manchester and recreational sort of and me medical sort of alternative compounds was not part of the curriculum, but I basically, I went to university and went into like one of the halls of residences, which was, I didn't know, but which, which was no, notorious for being kind of like a party destination. And at that time I was very into my Taekwondo, you know, I pretty much studied all day and then went to Taekwondo in the evening and came back late and I didn't get much much interaction with the other students, but I had a few incidences of like, you know, obviously like smelling cannabis and and also um, people taking all sorts of 
you know, drugs and and such to, to, to excess. So I had my first sort of exposure to that, seeing that at university. And, you know, immediately I was, I've always been a very like teetotal, teetotal kind of minded person. I'm like, anything that you, you take, you should not take. And, you know, I mean, at the time I was pretty much addicted to sugar, but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's the same with alcohol or cigarettes. So many or, of us are though. Yeah. Coffee. Yeah. Caffeine. Caffeine. Um, but I, I had that mindset and it was only until, well, my se- second, third year where I started to develop some, you know, close friends who started to like challenge those beliefs a little bit. It took me a long time to really accept it as like something that people do and not sort of tie it to their personality. Cause I assume that people who did that kind of thing were like bad people in my brain. Well, that's that what time. we're raised. We're raised to think that. So that's not, you know, this is totally. an, and it's an intentional bias that has happened, yeah. you know, especially with people who are a bit older, it, it is changing. But for those of us who were raised before in the U.S. it was 1996 in California, so mm-hmm. you know I, I was six. Well, well, it kind of like I think like the the whole sort of experience with that, and obviously like making friends with people who did it regularly and and talk all sorts of things. It kind of you know I got to a point where I was like you know like maybe I should look into this a bit more, and I started researching about like the actual like compounds and like how they worked um then i then i got into watching like people's experience with it which ranged from like recreational users to medical unit users to like people who describe themselves as like drug addict drug drug addicts not ma- necessarily marijuana but you know other, other sorts of things and i think that the, there's one time that the, like a little kind of switch kind of clicked in my brain where I was like, I feel, I feel like for most, most things in life, if we haven't experienced it, it's quite difficult to like relate to, to, to someone who, who does this kind of taboo thing that, you know, you, 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 you almost label them as like a different type of human to sort of separate yourself a little bit, or at least that's, that was kind of, you know, my, my mentality towards it. And the point at which things started to change a little bit was, you know, when I started like making good friends with people and realizing that it wasn't tied to the personality. It wasn't necessarily like a bad, a bad thing. Well, I mean, some things weren't, weren't good, but <laughs> you know, um, it's not like a defining character trait if that, if that makes sense. Um, I think I think it's because we haven't been able to share like so for so many of us who are you know so th- in in the U.S. the term is stoners. I don't know yes, if that's a I've is that a that, term yeah. that's used here. Okay, so so stoners are people who regularly use cannabis, and my argument has always been that stoners are medical users usually, even if you don't have a medical card. Typically, if you're going to be using cannabis every day, there's a reason that you've been drawn to it. And I think that there is this stereotype of stoners that they're lazy and, you know, no good, like that's deviant, another thing. Social that's deviant. another thing. Meeting like really high performing students who just took look like medical students particularly who just all the time they were they were doing something. Like, yeah. No, I mean it's a it's a stereotype that they teach us because it's a it's a fear and it is something that does exist right like if we are talking about potential negatives like you mentioned sugar we're talking about alcohol like the, the potential oh, to yeah. overuse yeah the potential to overuse anything exists and that is true of cannabis as well and overusing cannabis does lead to people you know lacking motivation and you know, it can lead to a, an any number of issues that do fit that stereotype. But for the most part, a majority of people who use cannabis don't. But until more recently, it actually has been unsafe to be visible with that identity. It's been 
legally unsafe for you to do it. And I never just like, I'm throwing this out there. Like I never thought that I would be as open as I was in it, even though I I got my PhD in the system of the brain that works with cannabis. You know, I never talked about it during my PhD ever. It wasn't until three years afterwards that I even first said it, right? That I was like, okay, like here, you know, and, and now it's been two and a half years since then. And, you know, my perspective has changed so much more since then because I view it as an accommodation for me. It's, it's absolutely a medicine too. Yes. That it fits that role, but it's an accommodation for my disability that allows me to live a very high quality of life and function very well professionally. And it is a absolutely necessary accommodation for certain settings for me, like networking events and high demand social or, or stimulatory environments. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I feel, I feel like you can, you can definitely overuse anything to some degree. Like you can overuse water. Yes. <laughs> That's actually a huge risk of MDMA. We were discussing yeah, MDMA and, well. and Molly yeah, before. Yeah. So PSA people, like it makes you really thirsty, <laughs> but don't drink too much water. That's like the, that's one of the biggest risks of that. Plus that ecstasy is usually mixed. That's like typically a, a mixture. But there's, you know, yeah. there's that overuse potential exists, with, like we're saying, with everything. Well, um, I know we, we, you've kind of talked about some of the, like the reasons and sort of your your journey and or story, sort of getting to this point. Do you think there's anything else that you know, if you can kind of think about, I guess, sort of like a, a mission statement in your own head of like things that sort of encourages you to do the work that you do um, do the online work that you do and and be open about it you know what what would that look like I think more recently I've been finding that I like to help other people find their own way and enable other people to feel that they have the knowledge to explore safely options that are available for us here that don't have a lot of guidance and the education is it's difficult the barrier to access is very high and so you know my mission really is about helping other people who are like me come to the understanding that I have because I have a very deep and and broad understanding of how I use cannabis for my mental and physical health and it changes every day. I'm excited well, I mean, we, to learn. <laughs> we, we talked about it just this morning. I was just saying like, oh, actually, like I need a little bit more of a dose before we get started. Like, but I, I measure it based on how I feel and, and based on the demands of the day. And, you know, that understanding came from like a really deep understanding of my own brain, of my own disability, of my own, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And how can cannabis be a tool just like caffeine you know, how can it be a tool to, to help me and how can it be a medicine and how can it be an accommodation and how can I, you know, get the maximum of that with, there's a whole bunch of different things. I mean, we, we probably get into it, but there's a lot of different products. And for now, for you guys where there's not as much accessibility, it will have to be increased once more accessibility comes about, but Mm. the number of products, the type of product diversity that we see in the markets over here is incredible because it means that it's different medicines and different medicines work for different people. And so, you know, I, I want to enable people to be able to navigate all of those choices and feel like they have some form of direction and that it's not just like a blind trial and error of, you know, well, I hope this works today because that's not a good medicine. <laughs> like a good medicine is going to be reproducible, right? Like, yeah. And I think what you what you said about sort of the the like the range of of product is quite you know apt for people perhaps um, in countries where it's not um, part of the medical system where it's not kind of recreational because you know obviously when you have a system like that which is not sort of looking into and you know, making sure the quality of certain things and understanding the different, because it's not just one thing, is it? It's, it's, it's a lot of diff, it's a plant and it has 
hundreds ve- very large variances in what compounds are actually within it so it's like and if, oh, that's, I think that's it's probably beautiful <laughs> it's it's a beautiful <laughs> variation I mean it's a diversity it's just like neurodiversity it's chemo diversity chemical di- chemical diversity endodiversity <laughs> yeah cannabinoid diversity terpene yeah, diversity yeah. flavonoid diversity is like volatile diversity is like there's I think it's depending on what paper you're going to look at. There's anywhere between 300, 400, probably plus, plus, plus. We haven't just like discovered them, different molecules well, that, in the plant. That's kind of a good, a good sort of segue into like one of the, one of the first questions I have for you, which was, you know, I, I suppose speak, speaking in more of like a, uh, a science media kind of way, perhaps a little bit more lay, but not, not yep. too much. Yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about the sort of the, the core like compounds uh, present in, in cannabis and what kind of effects they have, et cetera? Yeah. What they, yeah. We don't know the answer to it for all of them either. So this is and, – and then also it will vary from person to person, which is another reason why I think education is so important. But um, in a nutshell – I'm going to break cannabis up into two different types. There is like the traditional type of cannabis, like medical cannabis that people think of, which would be high THC. THC is tetrahydrocannabinol, and it is a molecule that's in the cannabis flower. So the flower is actually the part of the plant that contains the most of the active molecules. That's not to say that the other parts of the plant don't have value. Like traditional Ayurvedic medicine uses the leaves to make bong. And there's there's plenty of uh, there, there's plenty of other uh, uses for the different parts of the plants, but tr- like the flower has the highest percentage of cannabinoids. The cannabinoids are viewed as the active molecules that interact with the brain and body that create THC, effects. CBD. Yes, exactly. And all the all the little letters that come after uh, uh, CBG, CBN, CBC, <laughs> CBT, CBE, CBL. I mean, it goes, it continues on. <laughs> like, and they're all very, very similar to one another. They actually come from the same starting material and we don't actually know a lot about those rare, the rare cannabinoids. So I'll, I'll rewind them and go back to THC. That's the main active one. This is the primary cannabinoid that people are thinking of when they're thinking yes. of cannabis, when they're thinking of someone getting high, you know, it's, it's associated with euphoria. It's associated with, you know, the, the mental and physical effects. Like an interesting physical effect is that it'll make you cold. Drops your body temperature a little bit. I don't know that one. Yep, it's one of the reasons why. Like, it's an like there's a theory out there that that's like one of the reasons why also in like desert regions and stuff like that hash is very very prevalent in in some of those cultures. So THC binds to a receptor in the brain called the CB1 receptor and turns it on, and it's it's that action that starts like a very complex domino effect that can lead to some of the effects. Now, if we're talking about therapeutic benefits of THC, probably the most powerful therapeutic benefit of THC is that it can increase your appetite. And that's not always a good thing. Some people are like, oh, I don't want the munchies. And it doesn't yeah, always happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't happen to everyone. I, I actually I haven't get gotten it my the, tablets. <laughs> I haven't gotten the munchies in, in years, you know. But I mean, if you're lifting, you're probably going to be hungry. But, but like – the the therapeutic benefit there has to do with people who are suffering to keep weight on, are struggling to keep weight on while they're trying to battle something like cancer chemotherapy or HIV and it's it's a powerful therapeutic effect now the other therapeutic effects that come with it are like vast and huge like there's general mental health therapeutic effects like it's an anti anxiety there's been some research on it being an antidepressant, and this is where there becomes a lot of gray area when we talk about it. But I'll, I'll list the positives, and then we'll go into the negatives later. But it's an anti-inflammatory, so it reduces inflammation, and that has all sorts of effects on chronic pain and skin stuff. And um, then it also reduces blood pressure. And that's really useful specifically for like things like glaucoma, but also just like in general for blood pressure. And 
I ran a survey earlier this year, and to my knowledge, it's the only study that's looked specifically at neurodivergent people who use cannabis and why, right? Like what what are the therapeutic benefits? Now, the top three are the top three that are the same for everyone, like for the neurotypical, the general, the general population, which includes all of us, which is pain, sleep, and anxiety. Those are the three top uses for and cannabis. Three colors of um it's the main and most I mean they're they're also the top uses for pharmaceuticals as well. So they're like the three most commonly like used well, needs. Pain, pain pain medications can be like I mean it's it's it, I'm hard pressed to think of a pain medication that's like really effective that doesn't cause significant dependency or addiction in the long term. Yeah, like, I it's difficult because pain is a powerful is a powerful stimuli and cannabis is I don't I think it's very different in the way that it modulates pain I mean it, it acts upon a totally different system it's not as powerful I will say that like I, I don't know almost anyone who would make the claim that it's just as powerful as an opioid but it's powerful enough that if someone wants to reduce their opioid use or get off opioid use cannabis is very powerful in helping them to do that like also chronic. helping people chronic yes. pain aspects exactly. of it. Exactly. Yeah. Like pre-arthritic stuff. I have chronic joint pain. I'm I'm hypermobile and it helps me with that. They're very G- and then- very common for autistic people, I'd say. <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh my gosh, with all the overlaps of like the weird body, weird brain <laughs> kind of <laughs> kind of synergy there. And I I actually think that's one of the reasons why cannabis is such a powerful tool for neurodivergent people is that there is this overlap between chronic pain mental health and GI issues. And those are three kind of really big, broad, I call, I've been calling them the triad of suffering because that's how I have felt about them for my life. Like a flare in one will cause a flare in the other. And then almost always that third one is going to act up because you're not taking care of yourself. You know what I mean? Like it's, it can be a really fast downward spiral into that triad of suffering. And actually cannabis helps with all three of those things. And a, a lot of the therapeutic potential does have to do with THC. And I love CBD and I'm gonna I, I'm gonna move on to talking about that, but mm. I, I'm gonna end my, my piece. Of, oh sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, I was just saying I'm gonna end talking about THC, just saying that it's effective. It has therapeutic value and that it has a social recreational component too. But like recreation is therapeutic as well. And I think that specifically autistic people, neurodivergent people who struggle with that closeness, like to feel social reward, to feel an an ease of social interaction is absolutely therapeutic. And just for me, like from my own personal experience, you know, I, I never formed very significant social bonds until I started using cannabis. It, It allowed me to to form deeper relationships with other people. And that has gone on to save my life because the friendships that I've been able to form and the significance of all the relationships in my life, I I cherish them so much. I, I love my friends. And I would not trade anything in the world for my ability to make friends, which I what? I didn't have. So why do you why do you think that is? Do you think it's like a lot because it's really interesting. Because obviously, like, do you want me to get I've into the I've, real nerdy? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm gonna get into the real nerdy. I mean, may, maybe, maybe actually, let's leave that for one of the later questions. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've seen I, some stuff on like oxytocin. I love it. And, yes, like, that's yeah. that's what I was going to say. The endocannabinoid system actually controls and mediates oxytocin signaling for social reward. No way. Social reward is, yeah, the enzyme that I studied for my PhD is actually the mediator, which I think is so cool, but it's so full circle for me, actually. But uh, social reward is the happiness that your brain feels when it's interacting with other people. And it's not that I wasn't happy. Like the way that I described the experience of it in in my own brain was that I just always was on the outside. I just was, oh, I just was never fully in there with everyone else. And I just always was like, my hands were pressed up against a glass and I was sliding off of them. Like I could never break through. I was always just right there. And I saw it happening and I felt myself on the outside. I did. Like I knew that I wasn't connecting and I really wanted it. Sense of, 
isolation or loneliness. I think I think a lot of you know people, autistic people listening, will probably be able to empathize with that feeling, especially like during like the school experience. Like it's oh, it's, um, that was so lonely and just sad and terrible. Mm-hmm. Like I remember someone telling me that like. Oh, high school is like, and school in general is just the best time of your life. And I was like, I really <laughs> hope not. Like, I'm so glad that wasn't true. Like, I, like it's all downhill like, so. from there. <laughs> but I, you know, for people who are not going to be like late in life diagnosed, then I suppose that maybe they were happy, and that's, you know, it's a different experience. And the first time that I ever smoked weed ever, uh, I was 15, and I distinctively remember this because it was the first time that I was able to like glance at someone in their eyes, like I like, I like held eye contact for maybe like one or two seconds. And that was extremely long for me at the time. Now it's like, I could do that. No problem. Like it doesn't, it, you know, that's, that's not, it's not hard for me at all anymore. But at the time that was something that I'd never done. And it was something that always, if it happened to me, it would feel literally like someone took like an ice pick or something and was like shoving it in my eyes. It would be like, it would feel like my head would like jam out of the back of my head and I'd be like, don't look at someone in the eyes. Like it hurts. Like it, it hurts. It's like fearful. It's like, it like triggered all these like emotional, I don't even know how to describe it really. I, do you, have you ever experienced, like experienced that piece? I know it's pretty common for yeah. people to not like eye contact, but that was kind of like a I'm- physical response or like. I'm kind of like middle of the road, I would say. I th- I think I don't like eye contact as much as most people. I, t- I tend to be, you know, f- 70% of the time I'm not making eye contact and 30% of the time I am. I tried 50-50, which is what people recommend for like friendships and dating and like <laughs> workplaces and stuff like that. I love that there's a recommendation for that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to keep that in mind for like, if I have to interact <laughs> with a neurotypical. Well, they, it, I mean, we can go into like all the social perceptions that people have from very, very minor things like that, which are just Oh, really totally. Cool they think you're sketchy or that you're, you know, whatever. Yeah. Not interested in what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, that one gets yeah. me because I listen better when I'm not paying attention. Yeah, when you look it away, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Someone said, "Oh, I want to talk to you something important." Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It is, oh my gosh, you're so right. You're like, okay, you want to tell me something important? Hold on, let me um, let me go do something else. Let me draw while you're talking to me, and then I'll like actually be focused. You know, used to drive my friends that I took classes with crazy because. I listen the best in lectures when I'm doodling like that actually is. And I'm an auditory learner, which is lucky and probably another one of the reasons I succeeded in academia. But like I, I could just, I would just doodle in class all the time because that's how I would intake the information the the best, you know, it doesn't look like I'm paying attention, but that's the, the way that it works the best for me. And, and yeah, with the eye contact thing, I guess it's really common and it, it corrected itself, quote unquote at the age of 15. And I, I always was able to force myself to do it. Right. It just was something that I really did not get or like. And so the first time I smoked weed that's, when that's related to the sort of the social reward aspect of it, or is that, I'm not sure if it's just related to like overstimulation in general and that eye contact is a lot of attention. It's a lot of like, yes. It, you know, it's like similar to like when, when we got married, it was like, ah, or any time that you were like, a lot of eyes are looking at you like you can feel them and I don't know if everyone can feel them but like I can feel the eyes like on me and I think that there's a lot of overstimulation in your brain then that attention itself is a huge stimuli that can be you know jarring to people and so I think it's like you know and then that's also that's also why for you when you're saying like you know it's like oh listening to I'm gonna listen to you I'm gonna like look away it's like because you want to avoid the stimuli that's going to distract you from yeah f- from the especially if you're trying to like force yourself to do it it gets to a point where you're like oh my gosh to look at them for 50 percent of the time and looking away <laughs> and like what are they talking about <laughs> oh my gosh i yes. used to do, i did oh, yeah. i did used to do that <laughs> man i remember that i do remember thinking about that i i have like a very complex set of scripting behaviors that i've sort of like been editing out of my professional 
behavior set or not not editing them out just being more conscious of them and understanding why I'm doing them and like where it used to be that I would show up to like a professional situation and if there's more than two people present I will not form memory of the interactions at all and I'm just going I'm like a robot I'm just like reading people's body languages and talking about their interests the entire time and like you know having this really complex map of categories in my brain of like what that person's interests are and where they're from and where they went to school and what they like to talk about and that person and seeing if there's an overlap and then connecting the two of them into a conversation. And then that person hasn't talked in a little while and they look a little bored. Maybe you should talk to them. Like all of that kind of like just complex stuff that then at the end of that, I would, my body would just crash. Like, you know, like at the end of all of that, my body and brain would just be like, nope, that was way too much processing, yes, you know? I do, I do relate to that. Cannabis well, about, has been um, interesting for that. Like, oh, sorry, go ahead. What about uh, CBD? Because that, you know, for anyone who's in the UK, you, you'll undoubtedly like have seen some corner shops selling CBD vapes or lollipops or drinks, and there was a big craze about it, perhaps like, I don't know. Two, two or three, four or five years ago or something. Probably when, also, the, when the farm bill in the US passed because it yeah. immediately made it more accessible to us. And I think it always was accessible to you, but it wasn't like as popular, maybe. No, I know it definitely wasn't as, as popular, but then, then I go by like the, I don't know how to describe it. Maybe like a, the British version of Whole Foods, like uh, yep. Holland and Barrett. Is is kind of like the supplements and the sort of organic kind of natural and, focused, yeah. like yeah. We saw that CBD in the, in there, and obviously, like you know, looking into it, it's not the best quality, but well, it's definitely like around. And so, I feel like a lot of people in the UK kind of they either have this perception of it, like still still being s- somewhat taboo, or just being like a stain coil. Like just yeah, another that's... like supplement that people have. Oh, that's so hard because quality is difficult without a certificate of analysis or a COA, like a third party. And there's again, when we're talking about product quality and how we have so much product diversity with CBD, I really believe in full spectrum products, which means it's everything in the plant, which means that it has a little bit of THC, like not enough to make you feel pretty much anything. But enough that it's it the synerg- entourage effect or something. It like is. That. Yeah. The entourage. That's perfect. The entourage effect is actually a term that was coined to talk about our own brains and the endocannabinoid system has an entourage effect. And then that term got hijacked to apply to cannabis. But it makes perfect sense with cannabis too. I mean, it, we have a complementary entourage effect going on. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a big promoter of like full plant extracts that contain everything in the plant because there are hundreds of molecules. And so when it comes to hemp, CBD is really similar to THC. The molecules are very similar, but they feel very different and they actually interact with different parts of the brain and have different, or sorry, different receptors in the brain and have different interactions with with those receptors. And so CBD is non-intoxicating. It does not alter your state. It's a powerful anti-inflammatory. People use it for all the same reasons, pretty much. But I think that it's my personal opinion is that its biggest therapeutic value is probably in like a chronic dosing routine for most people. And I think its most powerful therapeutic effect is that it's an anti-seizure molecule and that it's a really powerful anti-seizure molecule. It means it also helps for migraines. They share and iteration. THC helps for migraines as well. And I think for CBD, because it's so accessible, you know, there's been a good amount of research that's come out recently about aversive behaviors, like for autistic kids and and CBD or rare cannabinoid formulations. And it's complicated because a lot of these studies, they have different dosings and there's different, and then how does that compare to what's on the market, et cetera. 
And so it really still is going to be trial and error. But if someone to me tells me like, this is just an example, and I'm not going to like give any specifics, I'm not a medical professional. This is not medical advice. Not We are not suggesting anyone do any of these things. And everyone should check all of the laws in their local areas uh, before they choose to do whatever they want to do. But if I were to instruct someone in the beginning, which I do often, to suggest like how someone would try it out. It's always just to start with the smallest amount, you know, like just start with one, start with half of one. You probably won't feel anything, right? Because you're not going to feel anything. And then you're going to feel safer being like, okay, I'll try a little more, right? And you get to a point where like, maybe you are going to like, you try a little more. And the other thing is maybe you try doing this over the course of at least say like, two to three weeks, because even with pharmaceuticals, sometimes you don't see the therapeutic benefit until a few weeks has gone by. And one of the biggest benefits, yeah, one of the biggest effects for me in cannabis is definitely a prolonged effect. So it's the reason why I use cannabis every day. It's the reason why I treat it as a medicine this way is because the effect will build and stabilize within my body. And so like maintaining it at that steady state is actually what keeps me stable. It helps me with mood regulation. It helps me in general with chronic pain, with my GI stuff. Like, and Because it's stored in like the fat stores in your body, isn't it? Like- it is. And on top of it being stored in your fat and then re-released because – as you like exercise or walk or throughout your day. On top of that, it also creates changes in the levels of the receptors, like in the brain. So every time that it's activating these receptors, it sends a signal and your body and your brain, you know, it your body and your brain is always changing. It's always changing from one thing to what it's going to be in the future. And so it'll signal your body and brain to change like either different levels of the receptor, different expressions like of the areas of where the receptor will be localized, etc. And we don't fully understand like these like long-term well, effects, right? Like the more, yeah. and, and it, to say that we don't understand it in cannabis in THC and CBD, like I will throw it out there and say that we don't fully understand it in the psychopharmaceuticals as well. So for all of the unknown that I'm like describing in receptor pharmacology, it, it exists as well in the psychopharmaceuticals. And so it's, it's the same kind of level of unknown. So I don't want to like scare people with this unknown and be like, well, we don't really know. There's, there's a lot that we don't know. And I think that that's exciting. I think it's also a lot of promise. And when it comes to CBD, it's my life changed when I started using it medicinally. You know, I, I use it, I use it daily. I got the, oh, nice. the full, yeah, full for recovery, for recovery it's huge. I, like for the recovery for athletes, it's absolutely an integral piece. It's more, for the, it's more for the anxiety and the sleep. Nice. Then um, it works. Me, but it's. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I use like a vaporizer and I have like the, there's a few companies in the in the UK that sell like zero to Well, not, not zero, but like yeah, as within, reasonable as they can get it down. You know? Yeah, within, within the legal limits for it to still mm. be classified as hemp. So yes. hemp is cannabis. Hemp is a type of cannabis that just has way, way lower percentages of THC. And using hemp products, I will say that if you are going to get drug tested, using hemp products can make you test positive if they are full spectrum because they have THC in them. But it's not enough for you to feel the THC effect, right? It's it doesn't. It's a very, very mild effect. And I started dosing CBD more intentionally and using it and evaluating it. Oh my goodness, a long time ago now, 2015. So eight years ago. And it really changed my perspective on a lot for me to begin to understand it and even to mix it with THC and to create ratios. And, you know, there are plants out there that are mixed as well, like plants, uh, cannabis plants that have both. So they're between. Yeah hemp and and traditional THC cannabis and there, so there's plants that make both and then there's there's products that you could formulate to have both right well i think that that's like i think that's one of the 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 issues in the uk because it's um you know because it isn't there isn't like a variety of different strains and <laughs> you know type types of it and ratios of cbd and thc that are like standardized and you do have to, I think, 
if you don't go through the medical routes and you don't get like the which I think you can do in the UK and some some clinics that have that have done it. Um if you don't go through those routes you are like you you're getting something which is high, extremely high sort of high THC low low CBD you know very sort of you know stuff that could it could have other things in it you know it's not like a it's gone through any process it's, it's it could have come from anywhere really yeah that's this think- is the problem of accessibility right this is an issue because the medicine is different and you could always mix them separately which like i do right i have cbd products and thc products and you could mix them you could dose them at the same time right like one right after the other but this accessibility to the diversity thing it really is a medical issue specifically for neurodivergent people because we we can react so differently to yes. any substance for for that matter it it's worth noting that our brains are usually atypical and many of us take pharmaceuticals like or have taken pharmaceuticals in the past and it Melatonin it is important being a yes, big one like, <laughs> i haven't so I, I actually haven't personally had to deal with this in a long time because I haven't taken any psychopharmaceuticals in like 14 years or something. But I know and I want to just say a PSA that that it is really important for CBD specifically that if you are taking pharmaceutical medications, that if you start taking really high doses of CBD, I'm talking about like very, very high doses, like this is like in the 500 milligram plus per day dose right like and usually for context usually like if you get like a whole bottle of something it'll be only like a thousand milligrams or something right so so this is like a huge dose but people do need that dose for seizures like people do need that dose for for migraines like it it is it is a high dose but it is also a dose that that people do need therapeutically but if you are at those really high doses, you need to be careful with your pharmaceuticals as well, because it is possible for CBD to make those pharmaceuticals last longer in your body. 100%, so yeah. basically, it doesn't break down as quickly, which then means that if you take more of it, you're going to have more of that in your body. Is it, is it to do with like the liver enzymes and yes. stuff? Like, I think it's like from a university that's like sip sip 50 or it is yeah it's a yeah. cytochrome cytochrome p450s yeah, so yeah, yeah. Zip. Yeah, yep. yeah no they uh they well, grapefruit, I mean, grapefruit juice is another one that yeah inhi- I inhibits love grapefruits. oh i love never. grapefruits too yeah, that's, that's can never funny. have them though, sadly <laughs> um well not at the moment i suppose but i mean i guess we have touched on like the potential sort of you know, benefits about around like social uh, reward and and perhaps, you know, a few sort of personal accounts from yourself. But in your experience, either with yourself through the research or from sort of personal accounts from other people, how can THC and CBD be beneficial to like specifically autistic people? Like I know oh. you talked about the triad of suffering and like <laughs> stuff, but is there anything else that you'd like to kind of? I'm so glad because I started bringing it up when I was talking about the survey for the pain, anxiety, sleep thing, and I like yeah. never got to the point with that with that story, which is you know that's just how I guess that's how it is. Some other tangent that was shiny caught my attention, and I went <laughs> down that hole. But yes, there are specific therapeutic benefits for autistic ADHD neurodivergent PTSD TBI people they're like for people with like different types of atypicalities definitely but you know specifically going down the lane of the autistic ADHD more like hypersensitive route hypersensitive hyperactive brain modal like neurotype type people there are some unique benefits like one of them is the mood regulation benefit which has been documented before. Mood, that I've can, never heard of the mood the, regulation. Like I assume that because of the euphoria and stuff, it would be like a right, like a uplifter, up, upscale. No, the uh, the mood regulation effect is one of the long term effects. It's one of the it's one of the effects that is, and this is also full disclosure. Like this survey was is 
is just the first preliminary one. We are going to have to do way more research. Actually, my nonprofit is planning and is currently doing the very first piece of that research right now. Unfortunately, people in the UK can't take it. So I'm sorry. In the future, when we go global, though, I'm going to send it to you so that you can share it with everyone if they want to partake. Because it's really important that we start to document these unique therapeutic benefits. So mood regulation is one of them. Another one is focus and productivity. So it's interesting. Most people think cannabis makes people lazy, but a a significant number of people will utilize cannabis to actually help them to focus and to get more things done. And then the last one is so close and so near and dear to my heart is overstimulation because sensory overstimulation is something that when I got diagnosed, when I understood that component of my brain, it changed my ability to regulate myself. When I understood that, you know, I'm not super light sensitive out of all things my wife is, but I'm super sound sensitive. I'm I'm very, very sound sensitive. I'm very, very touch tactile, like tactile types of sensitivity. I'm pretty much hypersensitive to everything. To everything. (laughs) Apart from apart from heavy pressure and vestibular and proprioceptive stuff. So I have horrible proprioception. (laughs) <laughs> I have like the most terrible proprioception out of everyone. I feel like I'm kind of small, but somehow I'm running into everything like just all the time. And I still so, don't know what the difference between vestibular hyposensitivity and dyspraxia is. I'm, I'm still I'm, trying to find somebody who is dyspraxic but not autistic. I can't. I can't seem to find anybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> interesting there's all these overlaps right like this is so these these accounts like this was what was really like so powerful to me is that i opened this survey for literally just 24 hours it was just a quick like let's take a snapshot of those of us who are willing to contribute to this information and i got over 2000 respondents in 24 hours and over 600 people out of those 2000 people wrote me a little message I, I said, if, is there anything that you want to share like about your use? And I'm also posting this publicly, so it'll be, it's anonymous. Like you can't see who posted what, yeah, yeah. but that, it, you know, it, you're, if, if you want to share your story, this is the moment because it's, it, it literally is still on my website. If anyone wants to go look at it and read what other people had to say themselves from their own experience, it's up there. And there's 600 different little accounts, different things that people wanted to share. Some of them quite detailed about experimentation that neurodivergent people have used. Um, And in the survey, it was mostly autistic ADHD people. There was like a smattering of a lot of other things and a small percentage of people who didn't identify as neurodivergent. But you know, this is really powerful because it's something that in terms of like you asked me earlier what my mission was and and the mission of my life really changed when I started being open about using cannabis for my mental health and about being neurodivergent and I, when I became out professionally about both of those things. it My life changed drastically because people started really sharing their personal stories with me, I, you know, and I out of curiosity as a scientist too, like I love the personal stories. I mean, human, human data is always going to be the most important data for a pharmaceutical scientist. Like I, I study drugs in the brain. I, I don't think that it's as important to look at what it does in mice as what it does in humans. That's just my opinion. I, I value the human in brain. In vivo, in vitro experimentation. I, I, love, I, I have <laughs> weird, weird feelings about mouse research because I did it. So I'm going to like be, I'm going to take knew, a step. I knew back. Some, some people in Thailand who did um, cardiovascular research. I'm so and not then, a fan of, I, I no, said, I, I said, no thanks for me. for the first few weeks. <laughs> no thanks for me. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I, I don't, they're, they're really cute. I think that they're so I know, cute. Mice, mice, and rats, and they're like I, little, I cin- you know, little Cinderella, like Gus Gus, and like you know, mm-hmm. like I, I'm just like not a fan. I mean, especially when it comes to neuroscience. So, also like probably clear, but my special interest is the neurodivergent brain on drugs. Like it's been my special interest for you know since I was 15. Before that, my special interests were like way less interesting to other people. So. Like that part is actually nice that it happens to be something that I think can help other people. But, you know, I'm very. Like, because well, when you were saying about like, particularly for the sort of hyper- hyperactive kind of neurodivergent types, 
What about like individuals like myself who don't, who are who are just autistic and I mean, there's obviously like loads of crossovers, and it's 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 based on like psychological traits and criteria that people can look for. But um, for the most of it, I'm autistic, not ADHD. Like, well, I don't know that I consider them different, but that's also a different. No, that's, that, what that's I a mean. whole. It's that's like, a whole. That's a whole rabbit hole of like. I don't necessarily believe they're different. I think that they might be different expressions, right, or different like because from from me to you and like how i perceive your brain like i don't perceive that you have like any less going on up here than me it just has to do with like the expression right yeah. like and so it, in terms of for that like it is very very similar in therapeutic benefit it just like maybe looks different and and if anything like you are probably more stoic and i i have a lot of neurodivergent friends i mean i only I am pretty much only able to pay attention to neurodivergent people. I feel like I I don't t- I don't really find neurotypical people interesting enough to like keep to keep my cuz I like the brain I like brains. I like interesting brains. I like learning about people and I don't know I, it- I do I do have a particular fascination with neurotypicals. That's kind of that's the angle at which I started my like understanding cuz I just found them like very interesting. I'm not kind sure like if a they reverse ex- autism I, researcher. Do you think that they <laughs> exist for real? I'm not convinced that they exist and that they're not just like neurodivergent <laughs> people who are like really really good at masking and like really really like expending a ton of energy on that or something. I don't know. I Maybe. Maybe. I, I can't I can't tell. I'm sure that they exist. I've had a couple of friends be like, "Well, I'm neurotypical." And I'm kind of like, "I don't think so." But <laughs> yeah. you're welcome to think that way. And I, I I just won't say anything because, you know, sometimes that's like pretty insulting to sometimes people like I don't think disability is a bad word anymore. You know, like I I think that it comes with challenges, certainly, and that every every person is different. Different disabilities have different levels of challenges and like different types of disabilities also. Right. So I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that for everyone, disability is not a bad thing because it can be. It can be extremely challenging, and it depends on your life circumstances and your yeah. your ability to I provide mean, for yourself. My my particular sort of thoughts about like like I've never viewed it as like necessarily like a bad thing. Like uh, as far as like viewing it through like the social model of disability, it's very that's very like applicable for me. But I think. A word which is like characterized by an inability to do something feels quite like like just the the premise of it is negative. Not not meaning that it's like you're the a bad roots person of the you, words of the roots of the word is what you're saying because it's disability. Mm. I feel that yeah. actually that's a really great point. I've never really thought about it that way. And that's the only like, that's the only thing, and it's like I don't mind calling myself like disabled it's just that i i don't like i I don't either i don't think it's a bad thing but the reason why i think has to do with advocacy because i think that like viewing disability that way and understanding disability is more powerful to be able to fight for like advocacy for rights and like so like it's rooted in that which is not it's like i've had conversations about this before too because the same thing with cannabis use like what you're saying about like that the adult use, the recreational use market. Like for me, like anyone who uses cannabis regularly, regardless of whether you have a medical card or not, it's likely medical, right? And there are problems with us like over-medicalizing our terminology. And at the same time, the reason why I do it is for advocacy because it is the most powerful route to getting access. It's the most powerful route for changing your legal, the legal perspective of, of the people who... You know, if if anyone here who's listening to like if the, if you know your local legislation, like if you are involved with anyone within your local town or your local city who may be interested in learning more about the therapeutic benefits, about how that we could bring about community level change and how community level population level change with cannabis and with CBD like is happening and does happen and can work, you know, there's 
information available, but you could just send them this, right? Like, or you could send them anything. It doesn't have to be this, you know, but you could, you could send no, no, them. No, 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 go with that. Yes. Send them this podcast. <laughs> send them this podcast. <laughs> Share well, them out. Sure. It's, it's like interesting. And subscribe and. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think I think it's interesting because I think that it's perspectives that like these are real perspectives and this is real data. And on one hand, this is new and it's new data. And like a, another data point I have to share is that our current study that we're running with 4,500 people who've responded and it's daily cannabis users, 91% of people who use cannabis daily, 71% of those people identify as neurodivergent. And it's wow. a, it's a high that overlap. That is a big crossover. <laughs> and I've been in the industry now for close going on five years, and I was in the academic research world of it before then. And I I think I can say with confidence that like the stoners are my people. I am a stoner. I'm a stoner scientist. I'm part of this community. My friends and my community are people who use cannabis regularly, often and heavily, and we benefit I mean from it medically. You know, I mean, th thinking about it, kind of people that I've that I met at university and like sort of in my life who do who do that, like it's I'm very hard to press to find anybody who uses it regularly, who either doesn't have mental health conditions or is is different in some way. Like it, you know, they yeah. they have. They're, they're OCD, they're ADHD, they're autistic. Like Usually highly creative, like a usually a highly creative type of mind, whether you're working a creative job or not, just like a creative abstract sort of type of type of thinker. It's a, we are coining it and we're, we're publishing, uh, we did, we gave a poster presentation so far, but our paper, we're ca we're calling it the stoner neurotype. It is a specific subset of neurodivergent people who have chronic pain, GI issues, and mental health issues that, you know, cannabis specifically happens to rebalance our, our systems. And, you know, it's not uh, That's for what everyone. I think is, is like a really, you know, any, anything which, which kind of touches on the aspects of like autism and mental health, I find to be, you know, something definitely like worth looking into because I know that specifically like things things like therapy that are not sort of guided by an, either another autistic person, neurodivergent person, or like a person who has a heavy amount of engagement with like the autistic community or knows people specifically within it, as well as understanding the, the different nuances of sort of, it's very difficult to find that even in private practice, but also like it's pretty much impossible for like general healthcare in the UK, like to find someone who is, you know, going to be good for you in that sense. It's um, same so here. So we definitely do have a gap. Like incredibly when it comes to difficult support, and very high rates of mental health as well. Like and we don't we don't neuro we don't match we don't match with with neurotypicals often in a way that allows us to have that open relationship, you know, with a therapist or with like a to feel safe and seen in that mental health you know sort of system and no it's a major this is a major issue and it's actually one of the reasons why cannabis can be so helpful therapeutically that it i don't know why this hasn't been used more readily because it's so easily accessible but the psychedelic therapy model is like gaining speed like you mentioned with mdma this is like it's clinical some but it's crazy also like results that they've seen with like particularly like I think I saw something about psilocybin and like nicotine addiction, something yep, crazy recovery rate compared to like the two or three percent that you get with like traditional. Roots. I mean, nicotine nicotine was probably one of my most vicious addictions. Like, I feel like every time I rank the top three, I change the order based on which drug I've had the most recently. Which, like, I haven't had a benzo in a really long time, but the fact that it still makes my mouth water to think about it is kind of like, all right, that one was like clearly very addictive and actually out of the three of the top three drugs that are the most addictive that's the one i had a prescription for right it was mm. like my prescribed medication but the other two are alcohol I do and get nicotine pres prescribed i do get prescribed diet dies of ham for like panic attacks and meltdowns i've never i've never particularly had an issue with it necessarily but i definitely do relate to the nicotine 
aspects of the, it. Like, the nicotine, it's... like the the crave, the, the like the pull and the loneliness. Like it's like an emotional addiction. It's like it's a heavy one. So yeah, no, the there's been some really incredible stuff and, and cannabis is interesting in that the endocannabinoid system and the serotonin system, which the serotonin system is what classic serotonergic psychedelics like psilocybin, like psilocin, like LSD yeah. interacts with. The endocannabinoid system has a very close relationship with the serotonin system. It's actually yeah. something that I gave a presentation on last year. Um, I'm, I've been very interested in that intersection because I think that there's an increased therapeutic benefit to using less of both of them together. And it is very common for people to use them together. It's it's incredibly, incredibly common for people to mix psychedelics and cannabis. This endocannabinoid system is a, I think like a cr crazy widespread throughout like the entire body, which I think is why like it has such like a, a variety of different effects. And I, I was and looking, because there, there are like hot things that you produce like in your body, which are endogenous like things things that you you produce yourself which acts within the endocannabinoid system like i think the i don't know maybe thc is like an analog of anandamide i think is it it's not like, it's not an analog but it's a mimetic a, a mimetic, mimetic a mimetic yeah, so it, it it like imitates it imitates it yes it's yeah, like the the anandamide is like the thing that you get when you have like a runner's high I used to be running all the time. Like, oh yeah, I'm an endurance. Evening, like. I, I'm endurance athlete all the way for that reason. Definitely, anandamide is is a special one, and the other one is two AG. And yeah, our bodies are creating them right now. Like everyone, I always, that used to be one of my favorite things. I used to say when I'd be like, people, even if you're anti weed, your body is making an endocannabinoid like right now, and it's it's essential for our for our like brain survival and everything, and. So it's absolutely like it's absolutely something that we've evolved to to have and and it's it's an evolutionary medicine in many ways we we have evidence of actually very recently we found evidence of actually using it as a medicine but we have evidence from even before that we were using hemp to make rope from the late stone age period so we've just had this very integral, intimate relationship with the earth. I mean, it's not just with cannabis. It's with with the earth. And yes. humans have, you know, moved on from that and separated ourselves from that, you know, relationship that used to drive what we are. We're, we are animals here and we belong in an ecosystem. And, I, you know, I... I I want to live in a house and have running water and electricity and all that. I love the internet and I'm, I'm kind of like, I love gaming too. So it's like, I, yeah, I like yeah, yeah. technology. I'm not saying that I don't like any of those things at the same time when it comes to like our health and it comes to like the food that we put in our body, like the quality of our water and what we're doing to our environments and everything, you know, you can't separate out our medicine from that. Like this is a conversation about, how or or it should be more of a conversation about how there are there are tons of natural medicines that are actually way more environmentally friendly for us to be like naturally harvesting from out there or growing and cultivating ourselves or just in using them somewhat minimally or throughout our diet as food and using food as medicine right like it's it, it's just complicated because we throw in like too many variables and and ultimately like the actual healthcare system has evolved so far that a majority of people want to go to the doctor and get a pill. Like that is, that is just the perspective that we have reached with where we've gone with technology and, and with medicine. I, I'm not saying that that's wrong. No, I, 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 we could, we could talk forever. I think about yeah. all the, the impacts of like modern day things on like our brains and how we work and our psychology and like oh, social this, media this, yeah is that, i think i watched a video recently from this youtuber called like the neurodivergent doctors talking about basically basically making a video on like the social model of disability about calling it that but you know he's, he's talking about oh well neurotypicals have designed a world where they can you know they make it so overstimulated overstimulating and 
uninhabitable in the long term so they can sell like psychiatric medication or something which i don't believe but it's it is a funny kind of like i would watch that i like i i think that i don't think that it's so conscious right like i don't think that it's like so no i don't even so conscious i think it's purely profit driven and it's purely about like leveraging and, and manipulating populations to purchase more of things and get people to purchase mm-hmm. things and that you're doing you that it. while while trying to save the most amount of money, which means that you're developing procedures that are polluting the environment and that use chemicals usually. I mean, it's just, I think it's like all of these different factors that I can't even fathom in my brain. And, and I really only have a good, strong understanding of how it affects cannabis, right? Like just, that's the only thing that I feel I could speak on but an example of that is actually what has happened to the plant and to the genetics of the plant over the years like the percentage of cannabinoids in say the 70s which is not that long ago you know it's that's like our parents time the the percentage that was in the, the of of active molecules that were in the plant was about like 1% and then they would say like, oh, really strong stuff might be two to four percent, right? All right, that is pretty 20, much he- that's pretty much twenty two percent, right? Like this, I'm, I'm just like in the seventies, like what people were smoking then was pretty much hemp, like it didn't have yeah. a lot of THC in it, and even the hash, which hash is a traditionally made concentrate, and it, it concentrated meaning like stronger, right? Like more actives. Even the hash back then was only about like twenty percent, right? So now our flour is at the like twenty two percent to twenty five percent. I've even seen up in the forties, which I'm like, what is going on there? I don't know about that. But that's madness. <laughs> it's madness. It is. I don't even know if I want that. Like, no thanks. But the you know the plant itself is is so strong. Our concentrates are so strong. And I mean, I'm I'm not telling people not to use them. I think that they have medicinal benefit. It's just about understanding it and being careful, right? Like I have just when we were talking today about me being like, I need to like redose so that I feel better, so that I'm better at this, and I'm not too fast in my brain and moving past like the the topics before touching on them. And that that formulation is like 85% THC. So it's extremely strong. It's extremely potent. And it's about like understanding the dosage and taking like a small little amount of it, waiting the full 10 minutes to like see how it's going to feel before just like continuing to take more and more and more. And those are the types of conversations that I think make people feel safer in that in that experimental phase of of figuring out like what does and doesn't work for them. And, and I think that's so important because of how much product diversity there is and how like what we were just saying about the the plant itself changing the medicine changing like that's why i think we need more research on the people and on these tangible changes and it is what like it is what i plan to do for the rest of my life is to you know continue to advocate for people to be able to have access to this medicine and also for people to be able to have access to the the education necessary to like be empowered themselves to have that self-determination with cannabis because it's it is safe enough that we can it it's one of the only drugs that's safe enough if if you were to tell me like oh do i want to give someone self-determination with like an ssri no (laughs) like no or or do you want to give someone uh, like self-determination with like a stimulant like ritalin consider adderall like vivance no like absolutely not because you you can't like the experimentation of that would be dangerous potentially right and so it's interesting cannabis is non-toxic enough that actually we can have this self-determination through community education and i think it's getting there i think that this is going to be you know i'm very hopeful for you guys over there across across the pond across the water i would, it really I would like to see it sense. change just just part and part of the fact like even if ignoring all the medicinal aspects of it and the potential good things that it can bring i think just the fact that we have tobacco and alcohol that's just rampantly binge drinked and encouraged (laughs) by parents and literally like a part of our culture that you know have 
manifolds more detrimental effects on the population than <laughs> such things such as that. I just just part and part due to that, like it just doesn't make much sense in my brain. That, I it you know. I really think that this is also an autistic neurodivergent thing too, though. Like it's like we're incredibly logical. Like we we want it, we want something to make sense because we want it to have like a re- it, we want it to have a, a continuity or some sort of like parallel reasoning like like what you're describing I feel like in my bones it's an inconsistency in reason and that doesn't that doesn't, doesn't I don't work like it me. yeah no <laughs> I agree I agree so I don't like that I don't like it but Agreed. I mean, with with we've talked about like sort of. I guess like the the science and the, the the ways that it works and um a lot about kind of like the benefits. I mean, I think it would be really good just to have like a I guess like a fuller picture on sort of cannabis as a as a medication thing or, or as a recreational thing. For people in general and also f- for autistic people, because I have seen some particular things, I think related to there's one one thing that was related to like brain development like taken before like the age of 25 i don't know if you can shed much light on like the potential sort of negatives that we know i'll i'll say what i'll say what we do know and then i'm going to put it a little bit into context that has a, a lot of personal bias right because as i said i started smoking when i was 15 and it wasn't a little it was like it was like the first day that I smoked, I was like, my brain needs this every day. And I think I was right about that. So that is my opinion. But that being said, there have been some studies that have been done about so in in general, we're talking about all the all the like big picture medicinal therapeutic benefits. It is true, and you cannot deny, and I just even said it earlier today before we started, that it does have a slowing effect or it can have a slowing or a reducing type effect in general on the brain. And that o- over the course of like uh, over the course of like repeated use that there are changes like we discussed earlier for positive benefits that there are changes in the receptor levels. There are the changes that kinda. there are long-term changes that occur. So there are good parts of that and there are bad parts of that as well. And there's absolutely there's absolutely truth to that for, and that it's not for everyone in general. And for autistic people specifically in general seem to be sensitive to anxiety, like in, in general yes. seem to be like be prone to anxiety. And that is a side effect THC. So THC is what we would call biphasic by meaning two phases, two phases. There's like a lower phase and a higher phase. There is a phase of THC where it reduces anxiety. And then there's like a second threshold where it will cause paranoia and anxiety. It will precipitate out yeah, paranoia. That's and that's anxiety. another thing that I was, you know, thinking about because you know, obviously gr- growing up socially different to a lot of people around us, we can somewhat develop like feelings of mistrust towards a lot like feeling that like we have to protect ourselves and also like a lot of you know because we're trying to think ahead and protect ourselves and try and understand people's intentions a lot of like paranoia sometimes as well social paranoia i used to go through every one of my social interactions sometimes i still reread my text messages honestly i do sometimes i'll be like was that rude and sometimes i'll ask if, yeah. I, if i'm comfortable i'll be like no, I do that as well. Some, sometimes I'm just in that state of mind and I'm like, well, I know I'm being stupid, but like, <laughs> did that conversation go the way that I thought it did? <laughs> Who knows? So there's definitely been studies that have shown that if you use younger than the age of 25, there are significant changes to your brain and decreases in certain areas. And that this can correlate to different, that it does correlate to different functionalities, right? Now, I don't love that data because I think that there's multiple ways to interpret it. But from my perspective, from my own brain, I do think that it decreased certain things in my brain somewhat permanently. I am slower, like in general. 
but I'm still plenty quick. Like I, I don't think that my brain needed to be faster and I don't think that it should necessarily function faster. And in general, when my brain is functioning faster, it's not a great result. It's usually spinning into some form of like burnout, like yes, yeah. running, you know, into a certain thing. So it's complicated because starting at a younger age can have semi-permanent to permanent alterations. And we do know that. We know that with other drugs too, though. So I'm throwing yeah. that out there as well because the we alcohol, also- alcohol, the white matter deterioration. And, yeah. And also yeah. the pharmaceuticals, the prescription pharmaceuticals that we give to children and that they stay on for longer than we know there to be on, right? So it's it's complicated because we are comparing cannabis to, we're saying cannabis to nothing, but usually it's not cannabis or nothing. It's usually cannabis or alcohol cannabis or nicotine, cannabis or Vyvanse or Adderall or, you know, an SSRI like Prozac or Luxembourg. I, I get, you know what? They have different names in the UK, huh? They're all different. But, you know, it's not it's not one or the other. So I, those those studies definitely exist. And I am of the opinion that if you have a child who is functioning well and happy and doesn't have chronic issues and doesn't have you know, behaviors or anything to be modified. Like, and there's no, like, not that there's no issue. Cause I don't think that any child or teenager has no issue, but let's just say that like in general, there's, there's like, life is pretty no good. Clinically, right? No clinically yeah. significant issues. Like, yeah. Like life is going pretty good in that case. Yeah, absolutely. Abstain until you're 25. In that case, don't do any drugs ever. Just keep being happy and healthy and keep doing you. Like that's my perspective. Like at the same time, that's a very small percentage of the population that will sustain a high quality of life with that without those tools, right? You know, we've been using substances as tools. We've been using natural medicines as tools for I mean, probably for millions of years, but for at least hundreds of thousands of years. And I mean, animals do it. You could, there's ex- particular yeah. animals that come to mind that that go about eating rotten fruit because they want to get the alcohol. <laughs> like <laughs> totally, and and specific plant specific plants. It's and it's mm. so it's you know it's natural. It's part of our relationship with this earth that we you know modify our brain chemistry to be in in some form of therapeutic fashion and. Actually, it, it's very spiritually linked to humanity in our like historic, like th- the history of our relationship with natural medicines and our spirituality. And so from from that perspective, to me, it's that there are populations that benefit from it from a young age. It's not everyone. And there are populations of people that should wait until they're older and that that's also not everyone and that a, 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 a component is finding out who you are what about the the component of sort of i don't know if you know because a lot of this stuff i looked up when i was at university and i haven't really sort of kept up to date with it but i did see some stuff around like like the potentiation of schizophrenia in in some individuals is that something that is because I know some people have the idea that you have it and then you develop schizophrenia, but a lot of the the nuance behind that is that it potentiates it, so it brings it on quicker. Yeah, yeah. it's like a triggering. the The way that it's been interpreted in the scientific literature is that it's a triggering effect, and I disagree with that as well. But let me first say what it is. There's a strong correlation. There is an absolutely, undeniably strong correlation that if you use cannabis at a younger age, you are more likely to develop mental health order- disorders, you're more likely to struggle with substance use just in general, and you're more likely to develop schizophrenia. And that's the one that is like the ding, ding, ding. Like it, it, the percentage is like something like you're like, I think it's probably like 4% or something, but the normal, per- the, the typical percentage in the general population is very, very low. So, uh, so I mean, 4% is actually quite high. But it's whether that is a result of the condition the conditions right. that you might have or whether it's a causing factor or I think it's the same you- same with like mental health and like drug use and so there's a strong correlation but is there causation 
Yeah. And mm. I don't think so yet. I think that I have not seen anything to me that has proven anything besides the fact that maybe people who are predisposed to schizophrenia are attracted to cannabis use young. They're attracted to ju- drug use young, usually trauma, and that maybe cannabis has a bigger therapeutic benefit because it's known to have it, – it is known and the experience of using it has therapeutic benefit for people who struggle, you know, with those things. So it's complicated. I, I can't say either way either. I, this is just mm-hmm. my opinion, but I've been diagnosed with almost everything. So I, I feel like that's part of where that opinion comes from. Sure, sure. Well, um, I have just one, one last thing before we, I guess, move on to the last question. I have, uh, I've come across lots, lots of people who do have that mentality, and I, I'm actually one of those people. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm asking these questions in order for us to get like sort of like the full picture. Um, but uh, I have, I do know people in my life who know people who would describe them as being like un- uh, having an unfunctional level of addiction or dependency on on cannabis and it, i understand like the nuance behind it it's like it could be anything that that person is is dependent on and you know out of all the things that could be possibly depended on it's probably like not not too much of a bad one but i mean is the potential for like abuse in that way that that could sort of mess with people's sort of day-to-day functioning yeah i mean it exists it exists yeah. with anything and it increases the risk with accessibility right like that that's true what decreases that risk is actually education and like knowledge mm-hmm. that the medical users specifically medical users who need high concentrations are at the highest risks for developing like more negative relationships but sure One thing I do want to point out is that cannabis is not as physically addicting as almost any other drug. Yeah. So when you do have a comparison between, (laughs) you know, people, it is psychologically addicting. That's true. But every single drug that has a physical addiction will also be psychologically addicting. Like the psychological addiction comes with a physical addiction as well. And so just in general, cannabis is not addicting when you are comparing it to other drugs that have way more addiction potential and, you know, alcohol and nicotine are the easy ones to point to because they're legal. And in comparison that cannabis is not as detrimental to your health and is also not as addictive to either of those things. But does it exist that people end up in a bad spot, in a bad place and using cannabis as escape and not, not being intentional with their use, not using it medically, not not moderating themselves, right? Like, yes, of course, that definitely exists. And I think that that issue and the way to tackle that issue has to do with community education, it has to do with community support, it has to do with openness. And I think that that, like, that issue existing is also a, a minority issue compared to that issue with, with all the other drugs out there that yeah having the same issue <laughs> and I, I like the fact that you brought up the education aspect of it because um you know i was i was around a few people who um used to part- partake in an array of different like re- recreational substances that i would i would not touch because i i tended to like do a lot of research into things but and yeah th- there's like particular like interactions that that drugs can have and i think like one of the ones that I always used to tell people who did it at like parties, like particularly like the interaction between ethanol and um, cocaine use, like creating that that very potent neurotoxin with the combination of the two, but also uh, experiences of you know obviously like students at parties who were were drinking, you know perhaps, and and then also decided to partake in you know, re- recreational marijuana use and getting into very bad spots as well because of the synergistic effect of them. 
So I definitely think like, you know, with, with, with a lot of things like this and especially with kind of this, like a uh, education can be like really like a small piece of information like that could, you know, be very beneficial to people for, to know, you know? Yeah. It's, it's also like our cultural approach to drugs really like in, in general as well, leaves a lot to be desired, I guess is how I would put it. It, it leads to that binge behavior that we make it illegal you know 100 well um i mean i feel i feel i was gonna go on to the last question where i was gonna ask you about sort of legalization of cannabis for is my opinion medical on that super rec clear. recreational <laughs> i think we've we've cleared up the medical aspect of it i think the the only aspect to it which i guess is a little bit less uh, we've, we've talked about a little bit less which is like sort of re recreational legalization like for just people in general like it. I, I know you said that like people who tend to have it on a regular basis tend to use it for medical reasons but do you do you see any like potential good things and, and bad things to legalization in recreational contexts Absolutely not. Like I am no. <laughs> very for, I am very pro legalization for both medical and recreational because at the recreational adult use level, a majority of people are using medically. So to me, it's just about increasing the access to the number of people. It, it also, it also increases the ability for people to open their minds to using it. Like specifically the older and aging population has so much to gain from cannabis it can help so much with a lot of aches, pains, issues, and stuff, mental health, chronic pain, GI issues. There's so much stigma in that population oh, that you're talking about. It's like definitely. Whenever I've suggested CBD to people, like, CBD oh, is that a part, of, that's part of marijuana, isn't it? Yeah. I don't want to be lazy and get schizophrenic. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to have the – it's an awful smell. And, like, to think of people walking about having the smell, like, everywhere. <laughs> Oh, it's no, very like I, surface level kind of but it is it is the opinion of them but you know it will change and it changes with access because when the access changes and the medicine is out there it works it works really well and people begin to know people that it's working for people start getting oh yeah i want to drink a little less you know like yeah, of course, you want to drink less. You should drink less. If you want to be healthier in general, drink less. And there's a known correlation between the amount of cannabis you intake and the amount you drink. Like the more that you intake of cannabis, the less that you'll drink. The more you intake of cannabis, the less of a lot of other drugs you take, prescription medications, including opioids. So it's I'm for legalization of both medical and recreational adult use, mostly because it is my opinion that a majority of use is medical and has medical benefit even at that recreational level because even at that recreational social component you're still reducing harm of toxins in your body by reducing different substances that are more toxic there's almost no substance that is cleaner or not cleaner is not the right way of phrasing it less toxic than cannabis it's one of the least toxic things we've ever discovered and so i am very pro it's, it's kind of like, because, because of like the I suppose the the amount of components to it, like I think there's like a term in the scientific community, like a dirty drug, as something that targets like lots of different things, but it's like a not necessarily toxic dirty drug. No, yeah, the the promiscuity argument there. I would argue that some of the sharpest single bullet, single target drugs out there are the most dangerous because they turn that receptor off and then you die. Fentanyl would yes. be a good example of that one. Yes. And so it's, it's a, you know, these opinions and these things have been crafted. These are all assumptions that have been sort of in this like pharmaceutical realm of how we think about our medicine. And I'm very biased as someone who studied pharmaceutical sciences so deeply and understands kind of the pipeline of, you know, how we get these new drugs to market and what it means and the profitability and all of that. And, and I'm biased because I've been a medical cannabis user for now 18 years and it saved my life. And so I have a strong personal bias as well. And I understand that. And I think that the argument of our, you know, our conversation about the legalization and for and against it 
you know, the argument there really hinges on community education. It really hinges on what resources are you dedicating to preventing the negatives? Because if you dedicate even half the resources you should, you could prevent almost anything bad from happening. That's my opinion. Like my opinion is that it's, it is so relatively safe. And I'm not saying that we're doing it right here. I think that we need to spend way more money on public education here. I think we need to start educating children here because the kids get vapes like in middle school and that's a problem. So like there's, there are issues with it. I will say this, that doesn't come from the legal market. It never does. The legalized markets are highly regulated. They're tested, which also, again, like you mentioned with like, you know, just there are there are safety and quality control things that come with regulation. And I think that that also is something that's a huge positive and that the issues that people think come with it are compatible by education and that they are happening anyways and they come from the black market. So if anything, introducing a regulated market puts pressure on that other market to hopefully, you know, it, it's just to increase their quality. And it's, it's also my opinion that any crime that's done when you're on a drug is already a crime. I don't actually think being on a substance should be a crime. If you're just like sitting at home, like, like if, if, if we're just like watching a movie why is that a crime? I, I so I just don't understand that. Like I don't I in my brain again with the inconsistency of like I don't understand the inconsistency because driving is probably the only exception for this. Every other thing that you possibly could do that's like a bad person thing when you're on a drug is already a crime. Vandalizing something, destroying property, destruction of property, trespassing, robbing someone, assault, like all of these negative stuffs that people do when they're high on drugs and that's not good, right? Like, but they're already crimes. So it's like, and, and also since we're talking about cannabis, let's throw it out there that it's not associated with literally any of those behaviors whatsoever, yeah. whereas alcohol is. <laughs> so it's like, oh my goodness, like uh, it, the inconsistency, like it doesn't, I'm, I don't know, I'm glad you're on the same page with me of that one, but like, yeah, all the inconsistencies to me, no, it, it makes me make, just be it like, make no sense. throw it all out the yeah. window. It doesn't make sense. Like, yeah man well i mean for any listeners viewers watching at home i'd love to hear if um, you feel comfortable sharing your experiences with cbd or dhc in either a recreational or medical use um i think the more that we can talk about these things the more that you know it's great and obviously like as as you said it's it's um we're not medical professionals, GPs. We don't suggest anything. It's just having a conversation about sort of, you know, cannabis in the context of, of autism and neurodiversity, which I think is something that we really do need to talk about, you know, given sort of the state of life quality for uh, neurodivergent folk sort of across the board. We usually, we usually have a segment here uh, where we talk about song of the day. And then we'll have like a little bit of a some some links that you can you can share and stuff. But I'd be really interested to know what song have you picked for song of the day? It doesn't really really make much sense. Song of the day, it's like <laughs> it's been three months. Song of the three song months, of, maybe. Song, song of, of the, the week, three months. Hey, I get I get three months. That's amazing. All right. Well, my song that I picked is "Acid Drops" by People Under the Stairs. And the reason why I picked it is because the lyrics of the song that I have really resonated with me from when I was young. And it's like when the stress burns my brain, like acid raindrops, Mary Jane is the only thing that makes the pain stop. And that's, that's something that's really, it, it captured me when I was young and I still, I still very much so feel the same way about how it helps my brain and you know i'm not the only one it's it's a very common it's a very common thing for cannabis to help people specifically neurodivergent people i was having a listen to this very like old school kind of rappy kind of it's it cool. is and it's, is it 
so so it's a lot to do with your like connection to like cannabis and and such that's and it's got a great i mean i also just like the vibe it's a good vibe (laughs) it's a good one well we will add that to the playlist which you can always find at the bottom of the show notes um whether you're on youtube google apple youtube um i've already said youtube any of those places you can find it (laughs) down below spotify in spotify there you go probably the main one um (laughs) but if you have enjoyed this please make sure to give it a rate um potentially drop a comment give it a like and i mean where can people find you like uh any links that you would like to share yeah, we talked a little bit about the psychedelic stuff. I'm giving a talk uh, at the second annual, I'm actually co-hosting as well, the second annual Neurodivergent Psychedelic Conference. So that's just ndpsychedelic.com. It's in February and it's all remote and it'll be all day, but everything's recorded and the tickets are sliding scale. They start at $10. And so if you sign up, you'll be able to get the recordings. And um, I'm really excited about our speaker lineup. It was great last year. That's actually where I gave the serotonin endocannabinoid system talk last year. So really excited about that. Uh, If anyone is interested in learning more about just like, I I have a lot of education material out there. My social media at Instagram is just my name, Miyabi with PhD after it. And I also have a small community that I am teaching about intense pharmacology and as I mentioned earlier, enabling and empowering people to like have more self-determination in their own dosing. And that could be found at doselikeascientist.com. Awesome stuff. Oh, wait. <laughs> Maybe you should put this one first. I have a cannabis nonprofit. I have a cannabis research nonprofit called Applied Pharmacognosy. We're the network of Applied Pharmacognosy and it's at appliedpharmacognosy.org. And we are currently running a the largest and most inclusive cannabis study. That is the study where there's 71% neurodivergent people and 91% of them use cannabis every day. Uh, Unfortunately, though, people in the UK can't participate in our survey. We do want to change that and we would love to partner with people in the future to make that happen. We would need a local UK representative, like a company or a university that would be willing to work with our nonprofit. So if anyone knows of any connections, please send them our information. Well, I, I will put those links down in the description because I, I, I mean, r- even writing it down, I, I don't know if I can. <laughs> I don't know farm. I, I've never heard of pharmacognosy. I have it. I uh, it's actually in our show notes that I submitted to you. So it's in oh, that. E- cool. It's in that cool. email. If you want to just go look at the email. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. no worries. <laughs> well, I know that you have a, a long day of social related events today and and likewise but it's been really really great to speak to you and i suppose like the last question i want to ask is have you enjoyed your uh 40 or t experience yeah of course i i always love having conversations with other people who are pushing are pushing the boundaries. And I, I really like what you post. I resonate a lot with the way that you craft, like how you communicate the experience. And Thank I resonate with much. that a lot. So it was really great to have a chance to talk to you more. And I, I'm just, you know, I'm excited to just be here and have a conversation with you too. So it was great. Lovely stuff. Likewise, it's um, it's been an absolute pleasure, and it's been something that I've been wanting to talk to talk about for a while, trying to find the right person. So it's um, it's definitely been like a really, you know, a lot of things that you brought up, even though I've looked into stuff like related to it that you know, obviously I I didn't know, and it's really good to hear it from someone who's done so much research into it. But guys, um, I hope you have enjoyed this three months episode of the first season three blah, 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 did the fireworks three. and all that season three um and i will see you soon possibly within a month for another episode and in the meantime please make sure to check out my instagram and youtube channel at thomas henley uk for pretty much daily videos and daily content and um yeah hope you guys are doing good and i'll see you later